let there be an end to incredibly boring speakers. They are not sophisticated, erudite scientists speaking above our intellectual capability. They are arrogant, thoughtless individuals who insult our very presence by their lack of concern for our desire to benefit from a meeting which we chose to attend. Hi there. My name is Johan Juber and I'm here with the Center for Transport Development and Industrial and Systems Engineering at the University of Pretoria. These are not my words, but Jay Lears, who wrote a really cool article called Let There Be Stoning. And I can highly recommend that you download this four page um, and, um, and read through it. Let there be an end to incredibly boring speakers. Now I've been asked um, to give a presentation about presentations. And whether you like him or not as a person, um, you have to give credit to Steve Jobs in how he has changed the way in which we use technology to actually tell stories. Or sometimes not use technology to tell very compelling stories. Why then is it that you and I have all, we all have experienced really bad presentations that you can just wish, can this suffering just end? Um, why do we keep on sitting in those presentations? And maybe more importantly is why are we guilty of preparing such boring presentations? And that's what I wanna spend some time on in, um, in this lecture or in, in this presentation to, to try and share some of the experiences that, that I've gone through in terms of uh, trying to become a better uh, presenter. Now, here's a disclaimer is that there's a difference between stories that we tell to share our knowledge and stories to get people to actually take action. And you'll see that I make reference to a number of books and I've pretty much worked through all of them because there is science in building sound and good presentations. Yes, some people, um, for some people it just comes more naturally, but there's a science behind it and I think uh, it is our responsibility if you ever find yourself in the position to have to make a presentation, that you actually study that science and, and equip yourself better in terms of, of telling stories. This fascinates me, not only because I'm a Toy Story fan, um, but, but the story behind this particular short film. Uh, if you don't know it, it, comes, it was, it was uh, created by, uh, by Pixar uh, back in the days, and they have kind of a green light session where the people that actually draw these and create these films have to present them to a slightly larger internal audience within the company people that fund the work and or plan to fund the work and want to, uh, uh, and, uh, and need to give it a go ahead. And then when they present this, um, the guys are terrified because they expect very, very, very critical um, feedback. And very often a project gets killed during those meetings. They would ask about rendering and they would ask a huge bunch of questions about these films, um, especially animation that is actually created. But it's told that when they played this movie the day, after a bunch of iterations, when it ended, everybody on the team expected critical questions and comments and criticism but there was nothing. And then somebody lift up their hand and said, I just have one question. That little lamp, is that a boy or a girl? And the guy that told the story said, that's when he knew they've aced it. As if your audience can look beyond the technicalities and the technology and really feel the message of your presentation, that's when you've done it right. And this is what we're trying to do. Now, <clears throat> in a really great book called The Writer's Journey, the author writes that you have to give your audience a metaphor for their own lives. You have to make it relatable because people are profoundly self-centered. 
and they want to feel that this story is somehow just about them. If it's not about me, I don't really care. And whether this is right or wrong, that is just something that you need to understand about your audience. And if you don't take these things into account, you may not um, build such a good or such a compelling story. Now, we're not talking about everyday um, uh, presentations and we're most definitely not talking about lectures because lectures very often have a um, very different intention. It is there to communicate a whole bunch of content to you, the student, that you need to um, collect and, and assimilate. Um, so if your lecturer's presentations don't necessarily look like the ones that you will see today, it's because it's got very different intentions. So it, I'm typically referring here to fairly high stakes presentations that you have to do to a public audience. Now, <clears throat> the way in which I want to do this, um, the rest of this lecture is by actually taking two snippets um, out of presentations that I've done myself. Um, not that they are perfect and you're more than welcome to leave comments and, and actually tell me what I did wrong in, in some of them. But I thought, well, if I want to preach, then I probably have to practice as well. So I'm going to give you two snippets out of two presentations that had very different audiences and very different intentions. Now, in my field, both of them relate to transport. Uh, and in this first presentation, this was a really high stakes presentation. It was in 2014 that we reported back on research results that we were busy with for about two or three years uh, that was funded by the National Treasury. Um, we worked through the university's uh, company called, at that point, Business Enterprises uh, at the University of Pretoria. And it all related to the multi-agent transport simulation uh, toolkit, which is an agent-based model that we, that we were working on, or that we're still working on. Um, so this is the, the title slide, this is what the audience saw when they kind of walked in and I'll introduce um, this as I um, kind of go on. But what I'm trying to go and um, what I'm going to try and do is to, if I can remember, present it the way that I actually presented it that day. Um, now yeah, the audience is from what is what we call the transport forum. So these are government officials, industry experts. It's a fairly sophisticated and high level audience. Um, so this for us was a very high stakes um, meeting in terms of sharing what we've done and why the work that we've actually done, the research that we've done at that point for two and a half, three years, why it's actually relevant and what exactly have we done? So in some cases, it actually turns out to be fairly technical, um, but we try to make it as user-friendly as possible. Right, so first portion and then at some point in the middle of the presentation I'm just going to stop. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome um, to the Transport Forum hosted here at the University of Pretoria. It is my privilege to, to welcome you all on campus and share with you our journey. That what I'm going to refer to as rolling out Matsum, a new generation of planning. And Matsum specifically refers to the multi-agent transport simulation toolkit. And like any good presentation, um, I want to share the agenda with you. So today is going to be made up out of a couple of sessions. The first, I'm going to talk about rolling out this multi-agent simulation toolkit that we've been busy with. I'm then going to hand over to Ms. Mapule Moore uh, from National Treasury that will talk specifically about public transport investment that has been done in South Africa. And why it's necessary that we plan properly for our public transport infrastructure. Then I'm going to hand over to Dr. Marcel uh, Risser, who's joined us here in South Africa from Zenozon in Zurich, Switzerland, a longtime collaborator of ours. And Marcel will talk about maximizing Matsum. Once you've got a Matsum scenario up and running, what can you actually do with it within a public uh, transport or a transport planning context in general? And then finally, we're going to open the floor for a question and answer session. So if you don't mind, please um, jot down your questions and we will have a session towards the end of, of today's uh, meeting. Now, in my own se uh, session, I'm going to unpack this into four specific bits. I'm going to argue why it is important that we actually start planning differently. Why we can't just have 
what we all always had, uh, why we actually need to do things differently. I'm then going to give you a bit of an overview of what is this machinery, this monster called Matsum. Um, I'm going to share what are we working on right now, and then also where are we going to next with this agent-based approach of ours. Why do we do planning? Well, in the words of Alan Lakin, we want to bring the future into the present so that we can do something about it right now. Because we cannot tinker in practice and kind of trial and error and put in a BRT system or install eTOL. Uh, not that today's meeting is about eTOLs at all. Um, but how do we actually roll out these interventions without actually tinkering in practice because it's very expensive to roll out a multi-million rand or multi-billion rand project and then realize whoops that didn't quite work out so planning is the process of bringing the future into today and tinker with it in a safe environment so that we know what the implications both the intended and the unintended consequences are going to be um, of our intervention now <clears throat> I'm a modeler and by the looks clearly it's not the type of modeling um, on the catwalks um, or, although I would like to believe that um, but we build models at, as representations of reality they represent something in the real world it is like a digital twin that we try to represent reality if you have a look at this this image of the house when an architect design plans or build these mock-ups you're not going to live in that little box uh, it is just a representation of what the final product would actually look like would this design of yours fit into the neighborhood where you're planning on on building it um, and different models do different things while this is really good from an aesthetic point of view and, and give you an idea of the look and feel of the house this model is not very good in terms of knowing whether the foundations are strong enough. Um, so we want models that are at the same time scientifically sound, but also intuitively valid. Now, the better models we build typically means we make them more sophisticated and very often more complicated. But I'm a sound proponent that when we build models, representations of reality, that these models should also be more intuitive. So how do we make things more representative and at the same time more intuitive as well? And that's our goal. Now, why are we interested in this from a research point of view? Now, some guy said that good research is starting to find solutions to problems today that industry and government will need in five to 10 years from now. But if we don't start looking and finding solutions for those problems, anticipating them, by the time that we really realize, whoops, now we're in trouble, we may not have solutions available. And then we have to start from scratch. So this is why we embarked on this particular bit of research uh, in terms of building better transport models, because in South Africa, number one, we deserve it, but also because we want to anticipate how can we do planning better in future. And what really motivates me is a while back at one of the South African transport conferences, one of the prominent consultants um, made the following comment. In his presentation, in the main auditorium, he said, let's be honest, a large portion of our budget goes towards capturing, mm, at best, questionable data. And this really infuriated me um, because when we build models on crappy data, what type of decision making are we actually um, building on, on, on top of that um, crumbling foundation? So we really believe in terms of the scientific rigor that must be embedded inside our models. That's why it's so important to us that scientifically these models are representative of the people for whom we are building these models. The people who need mobility and the people who actually need to, to travel um, to commute but also to move their goods and services around. All right, so I talked about agent-based modeling. What does it actually mean? So consider Joe. 
Joe here um, is a normal person. It could be you, it could be me. But he has a couple of plans in his head. Now, when I'm talking about plans, I'm talking about the sequence of events that he plans on doing during the day. He will leave home at 6 in the morning, uh, or let's rather make it um, 6.45 or 7-ish, and then he drops the kids at school, and then he drives to work, and over lunch he meets one of his colleagues, and then he goes back to his office in the afternoon, he goes to gym, and then he gets a phone call, his wife um, wants some goodies picked up at, at Woolworths, and from there he goes back home again. That's his plan. So it's a sequence of activities for which we know the activity timing, we know the route choice, and we know the mode selection. Did he travel by car? Did he use public transport? Did he use the car train? How did he actually perform and connect these activities? So that's a plan. But the problem is, other people have plans as well. In fact, some people have very many more plans than, than some of us. And there's actually an entire population that at any one day, each one of us picks one of these plans out of our memory and we execute them. And that is how congestion occurs. For those of you that are familiar with existing transport models, congestion does not occur because some mathematical model has loaded the, the transport and the traffic on the network. Congestion happens because you and I want to do our business and want to travel on a network, a limited network, and we are just too many for it. Now, why do we need an agent-based model if we have traditional and classical four-step models? Well, agents are autonomous. That's what makes, makes this an, an interesting and unique modeling um, paradigm. You make a decision on your own, autonomously, on your plans for the day. It's not done centrally by some office. You also interact with one another. You make household choices in terms of who will drop the kids today and who will pick them up and who will actually pick up a bread or milk on their way back home again. So we interact with one another. We also interact with one another in terms of avoiding congestion. If I'm stuck, I will choose another route. But I'm stuck because of our joint presence at a specific intersection um, at, a, at a particular point in time. And then we also interact with our environment. If I create an agent and I locate this agent in Brooklyn or Waterkloof in Pretoria, I will have very different attributes and travel behavior than an agent that finds themselves in Mamelodi somewhere. And this is important, especially in South Africa, because many of you may be familiar with this concept of the Gini coefficient. It is a measure of economic inequality. Now, what do we mean with that? Now, if we look at a perfect world and we have a graph where we depict on the x-axis the percentage of people in a country and on the y-axis a percentage of a country's wealth, then in a perfect world, 50% of the people will own 50% of the wealth. And 80% of the people will own 8% of the country's wealth. But this is not a perfect world. It is not an equal society. 50% of the people would be lucky if they own 25 or 30% of a country's wealth. And 80% of the people will be all too lucky if they own 50% of a country's wealth. So the Gini coefficient just takes the light gray area A, and then it takes the total area under the diagonal A plus B, and it expresses the skewness of that graph. So as you can see, the, the Gini coefficient lies somewhere between zero, which is perfect equality, and 100, or one, for perfect inequality. So the question now is, on this continuum between complete equality on the far left and complete inequality on the far right, where do you think the most equal countries in the world are on that continuum? At least the countries that we associate with equality. Well, here are a couple examples. Austria, 26%. They're not perfectly equal, 
there's some un uh, inequality in there as well. Right, Germany, 27%. Belgium, 28 Australia, 30.5%. Canada, UK, India. Now, note that when we talk about the Gini coefficient, we're not talking about absolute wealth of a country. We're talking about economic inequality, the gap between the haves and the have-nots. China, 41.5. United States, and this is a bit of a misnomer because some of the states are very low, 25-26%, and states like Georgia, for example, is much higher in, in the 50s. Brazil, 56.7. And I'm afraid to say that there are few countries or there are few things that South Africa is really great at. Being unequal is unfortunately one of them. We are second only to our neighbors, Namibia, when it comes to economic inequality. So there's a very real issue here that we need to understand. Now, my main concern is that when we look at transport planning and transport modeling, we rely on a lot of those economically equal countries and we use their technology for transport planning but it's not geared towards understanding the unique attributes of our South African individuals and specifically the spread in economic inequality so what does Matsum do? The model itself is an agent-based model, so it requires us to study people at a very individual level. So as the input data, it requires a population, a synthetic population where we model every individual because we're interested in the individual attributes and the individual behavior of our individuals. And this we get from census data. South Africa makes very good census data available in terms of the public use microdata sample, a 10% sample. And then we also use travel surveys or specifically a travel diary um, where people report what they've done for the past 24 hours, for example. So there might be an individual that says, I dropped the kids that uh, went from home, dropped the kids at school, which is an education three activity in our terminology. Then I went to work, I went to the gym, um, which is for me a leisure activity, and then I went back home again. Now, we talk about and make distinction between primary activities, and here we looked at home, work, education, um, either primary or secondary, and then also education as, as a tertiary um, education activity. In terms of the modes, in terms of secondary activities, we looked at shopping, leisure, education, that is dropping the kids at school and picking them up, and anything else. In terms of mode, we looked at walk, car, taxi, bus, train, and everything else, wheelbarrow, whatever you want. And we were then able to generate a population. But this is for people. We also in introduced activity chains for commercial vehicles, and here we've done quite a lot of work over the past uh, few years in terms of not dealing with home and shopping activities, but what we refer to as major and minor activities. So you can view a major activity as the depot, the minor activities as pickups or drop-offs that you actually do. And here we've studied more than 40,000 vehicle over a period of six months, and we really kind of slice and dice the data quite significantly in, in terms of how we went about um, modeling their activity chains. So when you look at Gauteng, we know where they come in, we know where they go out, what time of day. So we've really done quite a lot of analysis in this field. So the end result is something that you can actually see here. This is an example that we've done for the Nelson Mande Mandela Bay metropolitan area. Every dot is a color, oh, sorry, the, Every dot, dot is a person, and the color of the dot represents what that person is busy with. So you can see that it's around about 7.30, 8-ish. There was a big blob of green as individuals arrived at school. Blue is home. Now, during the middle of the day, you actually see quite a lot of shopping. Um, there's some school activity. And here, around about 2, 3, you'll see a lot more blue as students go back home. 
And you can build this entire full day model if you understand how people are moving, what they keep themselves busy with. And then we also know underlying to the activities which we visualize here in terms of how they move around. And we can do this for an entire metropolitan area. So secondly, we also need a network, the road infrastructure on which, on which these individuals will actually travel. And here we rely very heavily on OpenStreetMap. So I showed the example of Nelson Mandela Bay. Um, this is an example much closer from uh, kind of just around the corner from us. Now what is really interesting is this is the intersection between Linwood and the N1. Now right now, when I presented this uh, for the first time, this intersection has not even been completed yet. It hasn't been open to the public yet. People in the open source or the open access community, the voluntary uh, geographical information systems um, community have already started mapping this new changed um, intersection. And that's the real value of working with, with open access data. Now, it's not perfect, but it's very tractable. You can see who edited, when it was last edited. So there's a lot of value. So we take the OpenStreetMap data and we actually convert it into a network and we clean it up. Um, so we take out some of the nice round curvy roads and we replace it with a single straight line, although the length of that straight line is still an attribute, so it still represents the original length. And we do this for computational reasons if we model very large scenarios. Now, <clears throat> it's very interesting and it's important to be able to track this type of information and it is tractable. So you can have a look, you can create, if there's something that you don't like in the OpenStreetMap um, network, you can go and change it. If you want to add your favorite burger joint, create an account, go and edit it and, and add your bits as well. And here you can actually see one example of, of the traceability. You can see who actually tagged it and when it was last edited. Now I started talking to you about uh, Nelson Mandela Bay and I showed you the example. Now the area, Kwana uh, just south of Jutnaeg, was not mapped at all. It didn't exist in OpenStreetMap. So we started uh, in our team literally looking at the aerial images and just tagged and digitized the underlying road network because we need a road network if we want to build a representative network. Lo and behold, a couple of months later, uh, when I wanted to show Nelson Mandela Bay's authority on what we've done, this is what I found in Kwanabutli. We didn't add the names. Somebody did. We just planted the seed in terms of capturing the network and other volunteers came along and added the street names. And this is the fascinating environment that we find ourselves in. It's a different environment. Uh, people want to contribute. Just plant the seed, make the data open, make it available, allow anybody to play along and you get fascinating results. All right. So now that we have the input data, a uh, synthetic population and the network, we put it in the machinery and the machinery in this case then executes the, what we call a mobility simulation. Now in Matsum, this is based on a, what we call a queue based simulation, which means every little triangle is a vehicle. If there is not physical space available for you, the vehicle cannot enter the next link. Now this has very important implications. And this is very different than the classical approach of four-step models, which assumes that you are everywhere on your journey simultaneously. Um, here specifically, we are um, able to have realistic holding capacity. We are able to model and actually say, listen, this link is full. There is physically not space. Sorry, that last vehicle is not allowed to, to, to get on to, to the next link in its, in its journey. This means that we can model spillbacks. And we can model this fairly accurately because there is also what we call delayed capacity release. When the light turns green at an intersection, everybody is not suddenly traveling. That movement, the first cars first need to kind of pull away and those gaps actually gets released back into the queue. So it's a fairly accurate way of, of modeling the the physics or the, the machinery of the transport. 
So again, if we look in more detail at uh, Nelson Mandela by network, um, now we're not modeling the activities, we're actually modeling the vehicles. And we can actually see where they get on and where they get off and they actually travel on the network itself. Now there are a couple of discrepancies, they don't stop at stop, um, at a red light or a stop. We don't model that level of detail because this is not a micro simulation. It still is a meso or a kind of a high level. We can model an entire metropolitan area which you cannot do in a micro simulation model. All right, now once all of the agents have actually executed their plans, it's time to actually score them. Now the scoring actually is like you sitting with a glass of wine and said, I had this plan today. Um, I wanted to take this route, but I was so stuck. I think I'm going to, to change things slightly. This was a crap day. I thought it would be good, it wasn't. So how do we measure the, um, the goodness of a plan? Here the transport environment or the fraternity talks about utility or generalized cost, which is a unitless um, measure. And for every agent, we calculate the total ut utility, which you get from performing an activity that is positive utility. If I go to work, I actually make my boss quite happy. But there's negative utility in traveling. There's negative utility if I have to sit and wait um, because I arrived at 7 in the morning and the shop only uh, opens up at 8. There's negative utility in that. And there's also negative utility in arriving late at work. At some point, my boss is going to get pretty angry. Now, <clears throat> for every activity, it's a not, it's the, the, the utility of performing is a non-linear curve, um, which is actually the marginal utility of time multiplied by the time. And this marginal utility of money multiplied by money allows us to convert things like time and the cost associated with transport to bring those with different units of measure into one unitless value. Now, a lot of people ask, frequently ask us, all right, so what did you use for your marginal utility of time? And what is your marginal utility of money? But the valuable thing in something like agent-based modeling is we don't really care um, because marginal utility of time is one over hour because it takes the hour of time away as a unit of measure and the same with money. What we're really interested in is that the marginal utility of time divided by the marginal utility, sorry, yeah, the marginal utility of time divided by the marginal utility of money gives us the value of time. And because we measure this at individual level, we can also measure differences in our synthetic population. Because you're, if you're a high paying executive, your value of time is a lot higher than somebody that earns 200 Rand a day. And we need to be able to account for these things if we want to do proper transport planning in South Africa. All right, the final stage of the Metsum kind of life cycle is replanning. Again, the analogy of you sitting on the couch with a glass of wine is to actually then say, oh, today was really horrible. I think I'm going to change my plan. Tomorrow, I'm going to pick one of the other plans out of my memory. Mm, yeah, I think the last time I took that route, it was actually better. So I'm going to take that particular route tomorrow as well. And we have different kind of dimensions of freedom that we actually allow here. You're allowed to choose one of your existing plans. You can adapt the, the, the activity timing. You can say, I'm gonna leave home a little bit earlier to avoid congestion. You're allowed to change your route. If you can and you have the data available in your, in your modeling, you can also make uh, agents choose a different mode of transport. I'm going to leave my car at home and I'm going to try the hard train. Um, or ultimately, you can actually allow agents to say, you know what, I'm not going to do my bread shopping over there. I prefer to actually do it over here because that's more on my way back home. So you can actually adapt activity locations as well. Then once you've adapted your plan, each agent takes that plan that they've picked and this whole cycle actually evolves. And every time the agents try to improve and improve and improve their utility until we actually see that the whole simulation model 
gets to what we call a steady state or a relaxed state. Now the graph here shows you at the high level in terms of the green um, graph, it shows you out of my memory of plans as an agent, what is the best ones score? And we take the average over all of the, the individuals in the population. The blue line represents the average of the executed plans, which is in my view a little bit more realistic. And the red line uh, represents the average of the worst plans in the memory. And we see that they all converge towards the population making better and better and better decisions. And we also see that the travel distance, um, which is the black line, comes down quite, quite significantly. And this happens because of this iterative nature of the Matsum machinery. All right, so there you have it. This is the first one, or at least a part of the presentation that we made at the Transport Forum a couple of years ago. And maybe you understand what I said, maybe you don't. And you're welcome to comment and actually um, express, your, express your views. But I try to make a very hard concept as simple as possible because the machinery inside things like agent-based modeling is by no means trivial. But you have to kind of explain it and I think at least in terms of the of the um, feedback that we got it went fairly well All right but it was quite formal it was for a technical audience that are all well aware of of the field of transport planning and why it's necessary why do we spend billions not millions billions of rand on transport infrastructure so that was the first presentation the second one is one that I presented around about the same time a couple of years ago at the um, at another national conference but in this case it was a lot more informal it was an audience that I knew personally um, a lot better it was some of my former students some of my former colleagues um, it's the the annual South African Industrial Engineering Conference um, <clears throat> so here goes again very different audience Hi there. I want to share with you the tragedy of the commons. Now, for those of you that may not be aware, the tragedy of the commons is this dilemma where we have a shared piece of land. Um, there are a couple of herders that uh, each are allowed to put their sheep uh, and let them graze in this area called the commons. And if we allow individuals to only pursue their self-interest, we can actually end up with quite a disaster. So each herder only looks at their own little community and says, but oh, I want to become wealthier. And um, that means I want more sheep. So he adds more sheep. And he lets the sheep graze on the commons. And at some point, the commons get overgrazed. And then what we have is we have either everybody temporarily or permanently suffer. And that is called the tragedy of the commons is how do we align, allow everybody to improve their business and pursue their business interests um, kind of selfishly, but without compromising the environment in which we all need to coexist. Now the question is, what does this have to do with supply chain and logistics at all? And I hope in this talk it will become a little bit clearer. Now, like any good presentation, I need a table of contents. So first I'm going to ask a couple of kind of hopefully hard questions, and then I'm going to tell you a couple of things, and then hopefully I will get you to the point to look at the way in which we play this game called supply chain, supply chain, how we can actually play this game a little bit differently. Right, so that's the, the outline of my talk for today. So what am I questioning here? When we think about transport planning, we think about operations as industrial engineers. Um, how many trucks should I have? What should the fleet composition be? Which customer's goods must be put, um, must be put on, on which vehicle? What is the shortest route? How much inventory should I have? Should I have it at the warehouse? Should I keep the inventory at my retailer? Um, so th these are a lot of operational issues. But this is what happens, what I call the not so intuitive, but the state of practice way. Transport planning is something that the civil engineers typically do. 
Because when they think about transport planning, they think about infrastructure. Should we build a road? Should we ban a truck during the morning peak? Um, should we build this to carry just light vehicles or should we build this road to actually carry heavy vehicles? What should the life of this road be? So that's basically the game on which we play our supply chain game. Sorry, it's the board on which we play our supply chain game. Now what happens in transport planning traditionally is people would put this up, um, this map of an entire area, and they would break it into what we call transport analysis zones, where every zone represents similar land use, similar travel behavior, similar transport characteristics. And then for every zone, so it's, it's called the four-step model because there are four steps. The first one is trip um, generation. So they look at each one of these zones and they will say how many trips are being generated by every zone and how many trips are being attracted to every zone. So if you look at a residential area, it will generate more trips in the morning because people leave home and they move somewhere else. If you look at a transport analysis zone where there's a lot of businesses, it will attract more um, trips in, in the morning. So production attraction then gets matched in the second step um, so that they end up with an origin destination matrix. How many trips from every zone to every other, uh, to the other, every other zone? Now here they assume that you will most likely go to a closer trip or a, a closer zone than a further zone. And this is quite problematic in a South African environment where a lot of people love living in Pretoria and especially the east of Pretoria, but they all travel to Johannesburg. They're not choosing to either live close to their work or to choose a job that is actually closer. So this gravity type of model is not that sound in a South African environment. Be it as it may, we end up with an origin destination matrix. Now then it gets a little bit adapted for, for freight. And then for every origin destination zone, they will then start doing modal planning. <clears throat> they will assign those trips to different modes and then in the final step, they will actually take the different modes and route them on the actual infrastructure. Um, road transport drives on the road, etc. Now, why should we care? You see, the problem is that those people that are designing this road network don't seem to understand how supply chain and logistics actually work. They are not cognizant or they don't appreciate inventory carrying. They don't appreciate uh, fleet sizing. So it seems as if, as industrial engineers, we've just outsourced this process of designing the board on which we play the game, we've outsourced it to a different discipline. And it's as if the people who design the board doesn't understand the rules of the game. It's like designing the chess board without knowing the rules of chess. It doesn't make sense. Yes, that's what we've done. All right, so I'm not here to just kind of point fingers and say, blah, it's game over, sorry guys. What have we actually done to try and resolve this? Firstly, we need to play that game. We need to understand transport planning, not from an operational point of view, but actually understand transport planning a lot better from an infrastructure point of view. And for that, we need to understand how trucks actually behave. So we've modeled more than, than uh, 30,000 vehicles over a six month period and we've actually studied them, where do they perform activities, um, spatially, time of day, the extent. And this is what, I call, what is called a kernel density plot on the, on, on the right hand side here. And you can probably see this metropolis area between Bloemfontein and Cape Town, that near continuous highway. Those are informal truck stops. We also call them trees. But this is in fact how our logistics operate. But there's not a lot of understanding for, um, about this in the transport planning fraternity. So we've analyzed this, we extract the activity chains um, out of GPS data of a large pool of vehicles. We understand how many of these vehicles are within a specific geogra uh, geographic area, meaning trucks that spend most of their time just doing deliveries inside Gauteng. Uh, as opposed to long haul vehicles, their behavior is different. We've checked how many activities are there per activity chain, uh, the duration. And we've identified a couple of really important things. One being that why do government 
or authorities want to implement a truck ban, if we look at the time of day graph there at the, at the top right hand side, trucks are not the problem in the morning peak. So if we ban them, the consequences, both the intended and the unintended consequences, is not something that we can predict because we've never studied it. And that's where we try to fill the gap in terms of doing better understanding. Um, and what we tried to do with this analysis and this research was to actually say, but guys, trucks behave very differently than people. People get on and off the bus themselves. They get in and out the taxi themselves. They get in the car, they drive, they get off. Cargo doesn't do that. You need to handle it. Now, not only have we been able to study and analyze it, we've also been able to predict and imitate it through simulation. So what you see on the far left hand side is the is Gauteng. Um, and th for those of you that don't realize it, this was presented back in 2010, 2011, uh, when Gauteng didn't have its butt there on the bottom uh, left hand side. So this is the old um, demarcation. But you see on the far left hand side what we've observed. In the middle you see what we've actually simulated and the difference is projected in uh, in the middle. Now this is only for trucks that are mainly bound inside Gauteng. Suffice to say that even if we do this over a 24 hour period, uh, one, one calendar day, we get it pretty right. Um, so we, we study the behavior very well so that we can actually implement and imitate it in simulation models. So we get that at least so far. We're improving it, we're changing it, um, but we get it right quite well. Now, the value of this is that you can then start looking into a lot more detail. So what we would do is we would take all of these um, activities of the different tracks, we will take a study area, and we will project that on an aerial image um, so that we can perform what we call density-based clustering, which has got uh, two parameters, the radius and the minimum number of points, and then we can actually cluster these dense locations and we can say, huh, it seems here is something really interesting going on. Out there, that one dot may be an old Tani who wanted the, her DSTV installed, not really all that interesting from a commercial vehicle point of view, but here are high concentrations of activities, let's study these. And then what we do is we can actually analyze these type of algorithms, we can see how many of these we've missed, we can see how many we've split up. So this in itself is kind of cool and interesting research. But the real value is that we can then extract social networks out of it. We can see who's connected to whom. And that brings up some really interesting analysis that we can actually play around with. Remember, all in an effort to understand freight movement better so that we can influence decision making in terms of the people that design the infrastructure on which we need to play our supply chain games. And this is important. So what we do is we can actually extract, we can take the activity chain of a vehicle and we can actually say, but ha, huh, this is how the, individ the individual locations, the, the facilities are connected with one another. And that opens up social network analysis or graph theory. And there are some really cool uh, tricks in there that you, can, that you can actually apply and analysis that you can do on your data. And you can draw pretty pictures, as you can see. Now, on the top left, you actually see what is called a social graph, and that takes all of the clusters. You clean up the network and you see all these clusters um, appearing. Now, each one of those clusters are highly connected groups of facilities. What are they doing? More importantly is, how are they distributed? And here on the, on the right hand side, you actually see Gauteng again, and we superimpose the facilities and the networks on the province. But the shaded background is population density. Why is this important? Because where we have high population density is also where we have high concentrations of commercial vehicle movement. So what do we see? People and freight compete for the same land. What happens? Congestion. So these cohesive subgroups and studying them allows us to identify groups of connectivity um, or close connections that is highly concentrated. If you kind of look at the cluster here towards the, the middle right of, of Gauteng, they're highly concentrated. 
but some of the other clusters are all over the province. So if you want to look for eco e uh, economies of opportunity, those are the clusters that you want to target. Get them together, get them around the table and say, but how can we co-locate? How can we do better load consolidation? This is the area that we, re that we really need to focus on. But it takes sophisticated analysis to identify these, these opportunities. You don't just invite everybody to the table and those that are willing to play along, you then play along with. You identify the people that can give you bang for your buck. And we need to change our mentality to not just play with those that are willing to play, but entice those that can really make an impact in the game becoming better. This is just one more analysis. In theory, the between the centrality and the eigenvector centrality is supposed to be linear. And then we actually see these outlying dark dots that are non-linear. Those are the really interesting ones. They are the outliers. They are the gatekeepers. They are the individuals that can give you unique access to either information or help you to really disseminate your information or your new technology into your, into your industry. But it only happens if people share the data that we can analyze and actually do sophisticated analysis on. We can do a variety of different things calculating who the net importers and the net exporters are. All right, so what does it all mean? I really want you to think slightly differently about how you play your company game in terms of logistics, logistics. It's not just about your company. I know you have a bottom line to actually pursue, but there's a bigger game being played around us. There's a government who is planning infrastructure or who hopefully is planning infrastructure that will benefit all of us. But if we don't start changing the way in which we play this game and we only play our kind of cards very close to ourselves and not share information and not be willing to actually say, yes, um, this is not the limited pie theory. If I want a larger slice of the pie, hey, I just don't have to give up anything. I, we just get a bigger pie. Because I'm afraid if we don't, we will end up in the, um, in the tragedy of the commons. And it's a myopic tra uh, tragedy because we actually are so busy with only looking at ourselves that the outside world, world it will actually kind of implode on us. Right. And we may be left with absolutely nothing. And then secondly, it is an outsourced tragedy. As a center of transport development, we played a proactive role to bridge this gap between industrial engineering and civil engineering. That's why we are co-represented in the Center for Transport um, Development. But I highly want to, I want to encourage you to, to, to become a little bit more cognizant of other disciplines that we actually engage with, understand where they fit in, um, because jointly we designed the board on which the game is played. And I want companies, industrial engineering firms res, um, in logistics and supply chain to be more proactive in also understanding that I'm not just playing the game, I can actually get involved in how this board is being designed and not have a wait and see attitude, but a proactive one that allows us to, to build a better board in terms of economic development. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the conference and see you at the dinner tonight. So these two examples of presentations are quite different. They, some have got humor, some are more formal. Um, the, the stakes were very different in those two presentations. So you're welcome to make critical comments. Uh, I would love to get your, your feedback. Did you understand what I uh, was talking about? Um, but I try to practice what I preach. So let me unpack this uh, a little bit more technically when it comes to uh, presentations. There's science in building a good presentation. And these are two books from Gar Reynolds um, that I found very valuable as I learned to build higher quality presentations. If you want to play the rules of the game, you have to learn the rules. There's science behind building good presentations and you need to go and study it. They've got a really great online blog that you can follow and read up um, and I think they evolve over time as well. Suffice to say that presentations is a very different media and it has very different rules. And you need to learn the rules before you can even try to, to break them. 
While documents and reports are valuable, they do not need to be projected for the purpose of hosting a read-along. Not my words, Nancy Duarte, who's written some really um, influential and built some really influ uh, influential presentations um, and talks for high-profile people. In her book Resonate, she goes into a lot more detail about the science of presentations as well. Um, if you start copying bits out of your document and pasting it into PowerPoint or Keynote, then all red flags should start going up. Um, you're doing something wrong. Ask yourself, am I hosting a read-along? Now, this is very different than a lecture. And I said this at the start of the presentation as well. Lectures have got a different intent. There's a lot of content that needs to be communicated. So if your lecturer's slides don't necessarily have a lot of pictures in it, it's fine. It's a lecture. Here we talk about specifically high stakes uh, presentations. Now, <clears throat> there are a couple of things that I want to um, revert to or talk about in, in this last bit of the presentation. The first is presenting with type or different fonts, communicating with color, using images and video, and then also simplifying your data and give you some examples. Now, working with different font, you can read up uh, about it um, but there's a lot of, of literature that suggests that when you write a document, a font like Times New Roman or some serif font, serifs are those little squiggly things that you find at, uh, at the bottom and on the sides of, of capital letters. Serif fonts are good for documents. They're not good for presentations. There you're interested in a sun serif font like Arial or Garamond or Helvetica. The basic rule should be stick to one font font family. If you want to pick Helvetica, use it. And if you then want to change with uh, or have variation inside your document, select different variants like normal, fine, ultra fine, light, compressed, bold. A lot of the font families have got a number of variants, but they stay within the same family. So the look and feel stays the same. Have a look or be cognizant about it and have a look at different fonts, what works and what doesn't. All right, then in terms of color, ladies, gentlemen, many of you, it just does not come naturally. Um, if you wonder, rather use guidelines. Many people don't even know that some blues work with green, some blues clash with green. So color is a very sensitive thing and it can impact your audience quite significantly. So if you wonder, rather get external input or external advice. There's a really cool website uh, by Adobe where you can find interesting fonts and font, com oh, not font, color and col color combinations so that you have a consistent slide so that the things kind of tell the same or support the same story that you're trying to communicate. Different colors mean different things. Don't read too much into the meaning of the color. But think about these things. Um, Adobe even allows you to upload an image and it'll pick out of that image different colors and suggest complementing colors if you want to make something stand out. All right. <clears throat> If you look at this picture, which you've seen right at the start of the presentation, and I ask you, in what color is 1986? You might say white, but it's not. White clashes with your eye in this particular case. 1986 is actually the color of that text is picked out of the bulb of the little lamp. And suddenly it doesn't clash with your eyes. It kind of just looks as if it belongs there. Right, the same here, the background of the slide we chose is based on the colors that are in the cover of the book. Now granted, it's a beautiful book cover, that's why I used it. The quotes, the green, are picked out of the green inside the, the book cover as well. The same with this image. All of the text are, are colors that are picked out of the image itself. In fact, this entire presentation that I've shown you is built around this particular image because I wanted to tell a story about the desolation of a commons that has actually been eroded because of selfish um, acts of, of the herders in, in that area. So I wanted this tragedy of the commons to really be visible. And I stumbled across this picture. 
I didn't download it from Google. I bought this image and I can easily pay as much as 20, 30 dollars, uh, US dollars for, for an image. If the stakes are high, you have to be willing to really get high quality images. Um, even if you have to earn in South African Rand, it's worth it. The payback will, will be so much better. And once you have this image, it influences the entire storyline. Um, that's why I picked pictures and funny pictures of sheep um, throughout the rest of, of that presentation is because that it fit with this supporting uh, title slide of mine. Right, same here. The text, same color, but the theme is the same. Don't be sheepish about and um, about the colors you use or the images that you actually use. Pick things that actually work and integrate well that looks part of your image. I know there's a lot of clip art available. Don't use them. Uh, or if you use clip art, at least stick to the same image and kind of theme in your, in your presentation. All right, next I want to talk about uh, animation. Here you have to be very, very careful. Um, adding unnecessary animation if it's not functional is very dangerous. In the presentation that in the first presentation that I showed, I had a rotating wheel, but I wanted specifically to show the iterative nature of that wheel and at the same time reveal the graph as the um, score kind of um, converges towards a steady state. Generally, slide transitions and animation use it very sparingly. Um, it can be very confusing. It is like watching somebody else play Minecraft over their shoulder and or first person shooting game. And it, it just makes you car sick very quickly. So be very careful of animation, rather avoid it. In this particular case, it made sense for us to use animation because we wanted to illustrate what a GPS trace looks like and that GPS traces can actually be incorrect. So what we did is we demonstrated with a gray background and a red dot. Those are the actual GPS traces, but we don't know where the vehicle actually traversed. And then we overlaid it with the actual vehicle traversing the road network and showing how it left behind at different intervals GPS kind of points. And how do you actually then interpret this and do a lot of work uh, and analysis on the GPS traces? So here animation plays a role and we generated this animation um, literally frame by frame in R and put it all together again and we make use of maps. We make a lot of use of maps because maps allow your audience to associate with the content. Uh, they understand place. They understand the spatial relationship between different areas. People can understand distance. Um, so whenever you can, use maps. Um, <clears throat> but use them sparingly and think about it. Don't just download some map because Johan said use maps. Uh, carefully think what is the story that you actually want to tell. Then I also want to talk about um, telling a story with your data. Now, if you're in Excel, this might be what your histogram looks like when you sort your invoice line items for a nursery, which is what this is. Um, and if you copy paste this into your graph because somebody said, hey, you actually have to, um, sorry, if you copy paste this graph into your document or into your presentation because somebody said, hey, you have to have some pictures in there. This doesn't say a lot. I can't read the axis. Um, I don't know what these bars are. And for that, you need to what we call annotate the graph. So here is a different view. Again, this is not in terms of the size is probably not that readable in a presentation, but it's just a good image. Otherwise, in terms of um, highlighting what I mean with annotating a graph, this is a graph that uh, Dr. Elias Willems uh, developed for, for a report. And it talks about the annual sales and it classified the different bars of the graph as different commodities. Some are flowers, um, and it turns out that the highest proportion of sales is transport, is delivery cost. So this nursery is, is in fact not busy with selling plants, they're actually in the transport business. 
That's the number one line item in terms of volume, sales volume. And then compost and bark. Those are non-plant things. But the story only becomes clear when he annotated, added text to actually say, hey, you, the reader, this is the part of the graph that I want you to actually focus on. All right. <clears throat> in terms of, of size, be careful to use an image like this in, in a presentation or especially tables where somebody puts something up and say, I, I know nobody beyond the first or maybe the second row can actually read anything on the screen. Um, but what this actually says, and then you read off the table. Don't do that. If it's important enough to put on a screen, it's important enough that your audience can actually read it. Right. Or alternatively, at least add it and then play around with it to make sure that the portions that your audience need to focus on is actually visible. All right. We do a lot of our editing of images and annotation in a free program that's called Inkscape. It is available for Mac, for Windows, for Linux, all platforms. And it's, a, I think, a tool that you really need to have in your toolbox is to build proper images and annotate the images that you actually have. Here's one other example that we published in an international journal that deals with the acceleration of vehicles. We used color specifically in terms of no risk, green, low, orange, medium risk, and red, high risk. And in the top left-hand image, we annotated the graph to actually say, listen, this is what you, um, what you are looking at. Fixed accelerometer thresholds th that are set a priori, um, may deem very risky behavior acceptable. So we haven't even seen these risky behavior in our data yet. Some other research would suggest that these are perfectly fine. So we in indicate the, the risk level with, with the different colors. We add a little vehicle in the bottom left hand side to just orientate you in terms of the direction of acceleration. And then we compared a second vehicle or a second person's um, acceleration behavior in the bottom right hand figure. And just as a reference, we added the outline of the initial uh, image as a background so that you can get an idea that this image is actually, or this person is driving a lot more conservatively. And <clears throat> it's not fancy software that did that. I drew that outline manually, block for block, and it took me hours, but it goes into an international journal, the stakes are high, and then you eternalize the work. So do it properly and leave something behind. All right, a couple of final comments. And here I'm going to, use, well, let me not interrupt myself. Multiple presenters. Um, if you have to, please make the transition seamless. There's nothing as awkward as um, multiple presenters present being part of a presentation and then after one person has introduced the project say um, I'm now go, uh, going to hand over to, to Joe here who will tell you about the, the model that we actually built and then he stands back and Joe comes up and says hi I'm, I'm Joe I'm, I'm going to tell you about the model that we built and he carries on and then says now I'm handing over to Sue and um, Sue will tell you about the results Stands back and then Sue comes up and says, hi, I'm, I'm Sue. I'm going to tell you about the result. And you've lost nearly a minute in terms of introducing other presenters. It's awkward. Um, I am aware that there are a couple of modules that actually require this. I think it's seriously awkward. Um, only in one instance in my entire career so far, did we have multiple presenters? And it was a high stakes three hour presentation by sales executives from, from an industry partner of ours where we dealt with, with, the insurance, uh, with, with an insurance company. Um, and we were three people, one focusing more on the kind of academic theoretical side, one more on the sales side and one more on the, on the technical side for, for the different uh, people in the audience. But it wasn't a big audience. I think there were 10, 12 people. So it was a sales presentation um, that lasted about two, three hours. And it was the only time in my career. For the rest, I find it awkward that there are multiple presenters. So take note. Bullets, even seven. 
I know there are guidelines that says no more than seven bullets. I specifically made the slide with bullets because it's really boring. Don't host a read along. I can read, but if you your words are not 100% in line with what is on your screen, you lose your audience. Right? Unnecessary animation. I talked about um, watching somebody play Minecraft or first-person shooting games. This for me includes Prezi. I have yet to see a well-designed Prezi presentation that flies in, zooms out, flies somewhere else, then come back in and zooms over to some other area. It really is kind of distracting. Um, unreadable text and tables, we talked about that. And then being unprepared. If the stakes are high, please prepare and prepare well. Rehearse over and over and over and over again until it becomes kind of second nature because it's not about staying to the right text. It's about telling a compelling and a convincing story. And don't go over time. If you have 10 minutes, you stay within your 10 minutes. It is disrespectful to an audience to go over your time. Bad quality images, buy them. Or download higher quality images. Or do something or reproduce them. But don't use a pixelated image in your presentations. It really creates a pretty bad um, image of you and of the content that you're actually um, trying to, what, what you're actually trying to communicate. Can you overdo it? Yes, you can. If, if the, the audience expects to, to get a lot more content, you have to be very careful in how you communicate and the data, the actual content that you actually uh, communicate as well then you might have to annotate your, your images more to highlight the, the key values that they, that they are interested in. And both Gar Reynolds and Nancy Duarte's books are full of examples on how you can achieve that in a smart way. Right, so we talked about style things, right? Things that you can, can study, the science. But now you need, and now you have the knowledge, but you need to expand this knowledge about the science behind presentation. Learn about it. Learn about font. Learn about stock images. Um, learn about image filters. Learn about the difference between vector and raster images. When to use which. And then practice these things. Just knowing about them does not make you a good presenter. Practice them. Give them out to somebody and say, listen, be very critical. What do you think about this? What is the message that you're getting? And if they ask you questions, they say, no, 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 man, you, you don't understand. This is what, I'm, what, what, what I try to communicate. Listen to what they're saying. They are saying they didn't get the message. It's your responsibility to then go back and up your game. Presentations are kick-ass. I know it's a big fear for many people to talk in public, but it's fascinating. You are given a platform. You are given an opportunity to tell a compelling story. Use it wisely. Um, and if you have butterflies, that's perfectly fine. You're supposed to have them. I still have them. Um, I think it's necessary. Please make sure that when you script, you cannot see the author support that I have for many of my presentations. But the notes, I script many of my presentations to the point where in my script there will be a little block that says click and then I carry on with the text. So that I know, using this presenter, when to click and when to transition to the next slide. If that is kind of the stakes involved, then do it and do it well. Um, be sure to, when you write your speech, not I'm not talking about little cards, having little cards in your hand. Um, you need to move beyond that. But when you write your speech, make sure that you write it in a talking style, not in a written style. It's very clear when somebody has memorized a speech which was actually written and not in a talking style. So enjoy presentations. You have an opportunity to communicate, to impact other people in terms of how they behave, how they make decisions, and how they view the world. And it's your responsibility to, to, um, to be excellent.